Welcome, everyone. My phone says it's 8.30, so let's get going. Great to be presenting in person again. Little less great, it's this early in the morning. I hope everyone's enjoyed their parties or get-togethers last night. If you need some emergency sugar during the presentation, there's some stroke baffles on the table, manufactured here in Portland, but approved by all the Dutch people on the team. So um, Today, we're going to be talking about GraphQL API. My name is Alexander Farwijk. I'm the lead front-end engineer at Open Social. I've uh, been working with Drupal for just over 10 years. Uh, you can find me on Drupal.org or the Drupal Slack as King Dutch. Same name on Twitter. Uh, and I've contributed to uh, the web uh, Onyx GraphQL library uh, and the GraphQL module as well. Fun fact, today is actually King's Day in the Netherlands, uh, which is fitting with my username. Uh, if you want to see the slides for this talk uh, during the presentation or after the fact, you can find them on my website, alexanderdefarag.com slash talks. I work with a company named Open Social. We build community engagement uh, platforms as a service, uh, and we try to help organizations connect with their members. Uh, some of the organizations that we work with are on the screen. If you want to work on any of the things that I'm talking about today, then go to careers.getopensocial.com, because like everyone at DrupalCon, we're also hiring. Um, so what is and isn't in this talk? Uh, my initial Slides for this presentation were about an hour and 50 minutes, but they only gave me 50 minutes, so I had to cut some things. Uh, we will be looking at setting up a modular schema, and I'll take you through uh, the GraphQL module, what it takes to get from an HTTP request uh, to a response, and I hope that you get away with this to uh, have the internals be a bit demystified uh, and give you some confidence to dive into it yourself. I won't go into depth on schema design. I'll give you some uh, pointers there. Uh, and I won't be able to cover testing, but hopefully I can get that in an asynchronous format later this year. Little disclaimer, uh, I've been working with GraphQL in Drupal for about two years now, um, but while making this presentation, I also found some things that I could have improved, so I hope that you learn from this presentation, but don't copy blindly. If you find things that I could have done better, let me know after the talk uh, or later on Twitter. Uh, I'm going to go through an example based on the work that we've done for our real-time chat at OpenSocial. Uh, and we'll be looking at a little slice of that. I'll only cover the sending and receiving of messages within a single conversation, but those concepts should transfer to extending that to things like conversation management and user management as well. The first thing that we always do when we start with GraphQL at OpenSocial is to start with schema design. Uh, and the design is in there for a reason, because with GraphQL, we try to start from what the purpose is of the applications that we're trying to serve, rather than from the data that we already have. Uh, and one of the things that you may notice when designing a GraphQL schema is that you actually have some data duplication in your API. Uh, and usually that will be for different representations to help clients get access to those different representations more easily without having to transform them thems uh, themselves, and that's actually fine. Uh, for what we're working on today, we can actually use a user story, which is, as a chat participant, I want to be able to send chat messages and receive chat messages from other participants without refreshing my page so that I can easily communicate with others. Uh, that includes uh, receiving a list of existing chat messages, creating a mutation to send new ones, and also having a subscription to get real-time updates of new messages that are sent. A little demo of what this looks like. Uh, within OpenSocial, with the more full-fledged chat, you can see two windows. Uh, can create a new chat, search for users. When the conversation is started, we don't create it immediately. Only when the first message is sent do we actually create a conversation. And you can see that it pops up with the other receiver uh, automatically, thanks to GraphQL subscriptions. If you actually want to know more uh, about schema design and the schemas that you see in this uh, talk, one of the books that I found really helpful, uh, which unfortunately I only found after three quarters of a year of doing my own research, is Production Ready GraphQL. Uh, covers a lot of things for uh, schema design, GraphQL security, uh, how to have a GraphQL API in production, and also evolving your API in the future, uh, and giving yourself room to add new fields. Uh, I was so happy with it that I convinced our CTO to buy this for all of our developers, so anyone that comes to us and starts working on this uh, gets their book on day one. So with that out of the way, let's take a look at the GraphQL module itself. Um, because like all things Drupal, there's a module for that. Um, the GraphQL module uses the GraphQL PHP library under the hood. Uh, the contributions and issue trackers for this module happens on GitHub, so that's where you can find it. 
Uh, and currently there's two versions, which sometimes gets a little bit of a confusion with people. Do I use 3.x or do I use 4.x? You can also see this uh, in the usage statistics. And the difference can be explained uh, that the version 3 uh, takes Drupal's data and uh, models and actually produces the API from that. This gets you going really easily, but it does expose your internal data structures in your API, which usually with GraphQL is undesirable. Um, they changed that by rewriting the module uh, in uh, version 4 and going with a different approach where you have to define your schema yourself and then wire it up. Uh, today we'll be looking at version 4. It's a little bit more work, but you can get a much cleaner schema that way. Uh, there are a lot of people now on version 3 that kind of want to get uh, to version 4. Uh, thankfully, there's Jesus Olivas in the community who's been hard at work uh, on creating automated schema generation uh, as a module on top uh, of GraphQL version 4. Um, if you want to see what he's working on, uh, the updates on the GraphQL channel and Drupal Slack, and unfortunately, in PowerPoint, the link, I believe it's the GraphQL Compose project, uh, where his work has been published, uh, that you can uh, find what he's working on and use it yourself. So that's really awesome to see. So let's take a look at implementing our API uh, for this message exchange. The first thing that you'll do uh, when you work with GraphQL version 4 in Drupal is you'll define a base schema in your custom module. Uh, the base schema is there to help us with some of the common types that we'll use in our application, um, and we'll later extend those with schema extensions in separate modules to build more specialized functionality. You define your base schema by creating a plugin. Uh, this goes in your module under the plugin uh, GraphQL schema namespace, uh, and to help you get started, there's the STL schema plugin base uh, class provided by the GraphQL module. Like all plugins, there's an extension that gives us an ID, which is, in this case, DrupalCon, and a human-readable name to help your fellow developers. To make this class complete, uh, there's one function that we need to implement, and that's the getResolverRegistry function. And the Resolver Registry is going to play an important role in what we're going to do uh, after we've defined our schema file. It's going to store um, the resolvers that will help the module figure out how to actually resolve data. We'll dive into that in a little bit. But first, let's take a look at what this base schema is. So the schema for your base schema is in the same module as the plugin in the GraphQL uh, folder of your module. Uh, the name of the file is the ID that we just used, .graphqls. And in this case, uh, we've used the schema property to define our three operations, query, mutation, and subscription. Uh, and we've mapped these two types with the same name. You can give them any name, but just for convention, this is easy. On the right-hand side, you can see we've defined some base uh, types that we can use, such as date time, uh, which we use for time representations. The only field it has is a timestamp, which returns a scalar just to denote that it's actually a timestamp. Uh, we could have returned a timestamp directly, but by using an intermediary type, we can later add a specific human-readable uh, representations to save clients from having to add a date manipulation library uh, if they want to use the data directly from the API. What you also see is the node interface. This is not a Drupal node, but the node concept in GraphQL was actually introduced by the Relay client, uh, and we'll see this implemented in a lot of our types, uh, and it gives consumers of the API uh, a central way to refetch content that they may already have, regardless of what type it actually is. So the only field that requires is an ID. Uh, and then the last three uh, th or four things that you see, the cursor scaler, the connection interface, the edge interface, and the page info type, these are types that are defined by the relay connection uh, specification. Uh, and what this connection allows you to do, or what this specification allows you to do, is to implement pagination uh, in a way that is resilient to removal or modification of data. Uh, so the cursor is a value that's provided by uh, the server, um, which can help it in future requests figure out how to uh, generate the next page of results. So this is offset-based pagination. I won't go into the details of the implementation, unfortunately, but I'll let you know where you can find it since we have that open source uh, and how we have that set up. With our schema designed, uh, we can return to our schema plugin, uh, and this is the moment where we need to start telling the GraphQL module how to actually turn that schema that we've just defined uh, 
uh, into something that it can uh, fetch data with. And that's where that resolver registry comes in. So rather than returning it directly, we now store it in a variable uh, and return it later. Um, we can look into the resolver registry to see uh, one of the functions that we'll be using most often, and that's the add fields uh, resolver function. You can see that it takes three arguments. The first one is a type. This is just a string. This is the GraphQL type that you're adding the resolver for. The second is the field. It's the field within that type. And the third is the resolver, which is the resolver interface. And you can see that it just stores this in an internal array. To actually start adding these resolvers, uh, we use this function. In this case, we start out with the date time and the timestamp, uh, date time type and the timestamp field. And we introduce a new uh, helper method to actually help us create these uh, resolvers, and that's the resolver builder. In this case, we use the most simple uh, resolver that that is, which is the from parent resolver, and that just says, just return the previous value that I got for this type. So any field that returns a date time will return a timestamp, and for the timestamp field, we can just pass that along as is. The next uh, field that we want to map is the edges field on our connection, and for this, we actually use a slightly more uh, complex resolver, and we use the produce function of our resolver builder to uh, get a data producer, which is a concept in uh, GraphQL, these are plugins that actually contain custom uh, resolver logic, and by wrapping these in the data producer plugins, we can add some things like caching later, uh, caching, which we'll see in some later slides. What's important to note here is that after uh, the produce, you see this map function, that's where the produce function doesn't actually return your data producer directly, but it returns a wrapper class that has some helper uh, methods. And this mapping actually specifies how your data will go into your uh, data producer. And we'll see this connection input in a little bit. But again, we just use the, uh, the value for that that we got from our parent field. So let's take a look at this connection uh, data producer, what it actually is. Uh, you can see that it's in the plugin GraphQL uh, data producer namespace. In this case, because it's related to our connection setup in OpenSocial, we sub namespaced it to connection. Um, we have the data producer plugin base class with our annotation. Uh, the most important fields in the annotation are, of course, the ID, which is what we pass to this produce function, human readable name and description, again, for your valid developers. Uh, produce, this is uh, using the typed data API. Uh, unfortunately, at the time when I wrote this, I wasn't very skilled with the type data API, so I did the TypeScript thing and just put any there. Um, again, a human readable label for what it produces. And then we have our consumes, which defines this input that we just saw in the map uh, for connection, again, defining what this is. We implement the data producer plugin caching interface, uh, which lets uh, the GraphQL module know that it can cache this uh, value. There's one function that is important in this data producer, and that's the resolve function. Here we see that we get this connection as input, which we just uh, put in our consumes annotation, and the only thing we do with it is we call the edges function and return the value, and that's how we've uh, resolved our value. In our uh, schema class with the get resolver function, we can repeat this process a few times for other fields uh, to set up our other connection fields. We do the same uh, for our edges, and unfortunately the page info didn't fit on that on here, but we would do the same again. Uh, and that would conclude our base schema with those base types that we can reuse. To actually add some of the chat-specific functionality, we can create a separate module uh, using a schema extension class in that module. And what this allows you to do is it allows you to use Drupal's flexibility and modularity and only have your API available when the functionality is actually enabled so that you don't end up with an API that doesn't match what your platform is actually doing. So again, we start with a class, a plugin. In this case, it's a schema extension plugin. So we change the namespace slightly and we extend a different base class. We also use a slightly different annotation, which is a schema extension. Again, we give an ID, a name, and a description. And important to note here is that we specify the schema that we're extending, uh, which is the DrupalCon schema. Uh, 
to complete our class, we have to implement one method. Uh, again, uh, this is the register resolvers function, so slightly different from the schema class. And you can see here that we actually get the resolver registry uh, that we just created in our base schema class as input. Uh, and again, to help us with these data, uh, data producers or resolvers, we create our resolver builder uh, variable. The next step is to define our actual uh, schema in this module. Uh, and we split this over two files this time. The first file is a base file. So this is, again, in the GraphQL folder. It will be your schema extension id.base.graphqls. And what this base file allows us to do is to define all the types that are specific uh, to this module. Uh, in the next slide, we'll add to that an extension file. And that's a file that allows us to extend types defined in other modules. So what we have here is quite a lot. I'll go through it quickly. Uh, we have our chat message which contains some fields that uh, yeah, give information about the message that was sent, such as a sender. Uh, pattern we use is to use an actor as the sender rather than a user directly. Uh, and this is because in the future we also want to support things like chatbots and automated systems sending uh, messages. So by creating some indirection here, we give ourselves that flexibility. You can see that the content is actually defined as a union, so our content can be one of three types. The, most, the type we'll use most often is the media chat message content, which just contains a string, which is the message that we're sending. Uh, the other option is a user event chat message content, which can have an event like conversation created, join, part, to indicate actions that users take. It also has a subject to indicate who the action uh, was taken on. And we can use that together with the sender to create different types of events. So for example, if I would remove you from a conversation, I would be the sender of the event, but you would be the subject. Whereas if you left yourself, you would be both the sender and the subject. Uh, finally, we have the deleted chat message content. That's when someone deletes a, content, uh, a message. We want to indicate that the message was there, but actually throw away the content so that it doesn't uh, accidentally get loaded by anyone. Uh, in GraphQL, you cannot create empty types, uh, but a workaround that's been uh, sort of standardized is to use an underscore with a nullable Boolean. Uh, and we'll see how we always return null there in case it does get selected. Um, furthermore, you can see that we actually implement our connection here uh, using those interfaces we defined in our base schema module. Uh, and finally, we uh, implement two inputs with our, which are used in our mutation, uh, as well as a payload which is returned by our mutation. And this is again a pattern that was uh, promoted by the Relay GraphQL client which says if you always have an input uh, type, then you can evolve that over time. And the payload, uh, using a payload rather than returning a value directly, uh, also allows us to add other information, such as user errors, uh, or maybe we want to add information about the sender rather than just the chat message in our API in the future. So with those new uh, types defined uh, in our base schema file, we can go to the extensions schema file. So this is drupalcon underscore chat dot extension dot graphqls. And this is where we alter the query mutation and subscription type that we defined in our base uh, schema module. We add two fields to our queries. The first is chat messages to get a list of messages using uh, the pagination. And we define a field to fetch a single chat message. For a mutation, uh, we create a fewer sent uh, user chat message. Um, the reason we include the fewer here is to indicate to our API consumer that they don't need to specify a sender, but we're actually using the person accessing the API. Uh, and finally, we extend our subscription type to say you can subscribe to new messages. You'll just get a chat message directly. So with our schemas defined, let's go back to our uh, extension class and actually uh, look at how we define our resolvers for some of these types. I won't go through all of them, but I've picked a few that I think are interesting to show how to use this uh, resolver builder class. So the first one is the chat message fields, and we can actually use a data producer that is provided by the GraphQL uh, module, which is the entity load by UUID, and it takes two arguments. It takes a type and the UUID, uh, the type for us is always the same. It's always chat message. So we use the from value uh, builder, which will always just return that string or value exactly. Uh, 
and the other is the from argument builder. In this case, we used the ID argument, which was the only argument that we had on our chat message field. So this is actually the user input that we're using. Uh, and the result will be the entity that's loaded or null in case uh, the entity couldn't be found. For our pagination, uh, we do the same thing, uh, except we map a few more fields and we always use uh, all of the arguments. And here we use a custom uh, data producer. So this is the messages and this is the, where we uh, did the pagination implementation uh, for open social. Uh, Unfortunately, that could be a talk on itself, uh, but if you want to take a look at it, it's in the open social repository. Uh, the base classes are in the GraphQL namespace, and what we've done is we've created a data producer that always returns an entity connection class. The entity connection class contains all the difficult logic of figuring out how to do the pagination, how to do sorting, figuring out whether there's more or, uh, results or whether there's a previous page, uh, and the only uh, argument the entity connection class uses is actually a query uh, helper. Uh, and this query helper implements the specifics for the entity that we're trying to load. And this is creating, for example, the entity query, uh, because if you wanted to load profile data based on user sorting, um, you would have to set that up differently. So we could, that allowed us to separate uh, those two specific things. There's a query helper implementation for topics, which again, unfortunately, you can see at the bottom of the uh, slides, fell, fell off a little bit. <laughs> um, let's look at the next one. So the other interesting one is for this deleted type that we had. Uh, here again, we use from value to always return uh, a single value. We do have to map all our fields, so we also map the underscore, uh, and we just always return null. Uh, finally, the, uh, we're not the only thing we can resolve our um, values, but we also sometimes need to resolve a type. And this is for our union, which we defined, because it can actually be one of three concrete types. So we need a way to tell the GraphQL module and the GraphQL library which type it's actually working with. Uh, you can see that we do this, we don't define a field, but we only define the type that we're resolving, uh, and we give it a callable. In this case, the callable is a static function on our chat type resolver class. Uh, and when we look at that, we can see that it's a relatively simple class that only has the one uh, function. As an input, it get the gets the message content, um, and what it returns is the concrete type name uh, in your GraphQL schema. So you can see that that's done here with a switch based on some uh, information that we've defined for our entity implementation. Uh, in case we get anything else that we don't know, then we're gonna throw an error and some developer messed up somewhere that we need to uh, fix. Um, finally, we also need to register our mutation. Uh, and since we uh, use a pattern for this across all of our mutations, we've created a little helper function in OpenSocial, which we call register mutation resolver. We give it our registry, our builder, and the field name that we wanna resolve for. And if you look at the implementation, it can use that uh, to figure out the data producers that it needs to load. So for mutations, we actually always use two uh, data producers. The first one is for input, and the, other, the next one is for output. In our input data producer, we take the raw user input, we do validation on it, and we actually convert it to a typed class in PHP, and that class then gets passed to uh, our second data producer. And this is used uh, done with the compose function from uh, our resolver builder. And you can see that we use from parent here again, but this time from parent is not actually the parent value from our previous fields, but it is the value from our previous data producer within the compose function. Uh, the second data producer takes this typed class, which is now easier to use, checks whether it's value, valid, uh, and it contains any actual business logic uh, with that input. Uh, and with those highlights, you can basically copy paste it to create uh, resolver mappings for all your other uh, fields as well. So Drupal with that could actually already do querying uh, and mutations, but it can't cover uh, subscriptions. So for that, we need to add something else. Uh, what we've done is we added a separate uh, service, because Drupal itself doesn't really do long running connections, uh, and we also found that the way Drupal does data loading doesn't lend itself well 
to running it as a long running process. So we've added a subscription server in between. Uh, and what that does is it handles the subscriptions from the client. And whenever something changes in Drupal, Drupal will send a message through RabbitMQ, uh, which triggers the subscription server to uh, fetch this updated data using a GraphQL query, and then pass that data onto the subscription that it's serve, serving. Uh, if you want to know more about the tech that's used within this, I did a talk about this in GraphQL Galaxy uh, at the link below. We can look a bit uh, closer at the innards of this. Um, if you looked at our schema, then you can see that there's a parallel between our uh, subscription field, which returns a chat message, uh, and our query, which also returns a chat message. Um, you may see that the query field is nullable uh, and our subscription is not, which could cause errors. But because we get our ID from Drupal itself, we know that the chat message actually exists, so it's okay to have our subscription non-nullable. Um, what we do in the subscription server itself is we actually take the subscription query from the client and we rewrite it into a query uh, that we can send to Drupal. So we start at the top with the reference query, uh, and this just selects the chat message fields uh, with the ID. The ID here is a placeholder field. Um, the next step, which unfortunately doesn't fit in slides in this presentation, is to take, that uh, to take that reference query and our subscription and actually remap all the fields into our query and use field aliases to make sure that the structure of the response is the same as what our subscription client expects. Uh, the next step is to take the client, the GraphQL client that we set up for this particular uh, subscription. That's actually where we do a bit of user impersonation. You could consider it a man in the middle attack. Um, and then we execute our query with, uh, with uh, Drupal. Uh, and we send the response as a next message frame uh, back to the client. The next message class here comes from the GraphQL WS PHP library, which you can find on GitHub uh, and packages. Uh, and it implements the GraphQL WS uh, specification. So that actually works with all the major uh, GraphQL clients. And that's how we manage to uh, serve subscriptions while keeping all the data in Drupal itself. Now that we have everything set up, let's take a look inside the GraphQL module at how we actually go from such an HTTP request to uh, our final data response. This is gonna contain some diagrams and it, the important parts uh, we'll zoom into a bit of code. So the first thing that happens when we have an HTTP request coming into Drupal um, is that it actually figures out uh, which server entity is associated with that route. Uh, so there's a route producer in the GraphQL module that will take your server entity configurations that you can make through the GraphQL module, uh, and it'll map that to the route that the request is coming into. It'll pass this on to a query route enhancer, uh, that will load the server, it'll convert the raw GraphQL request to a server operations class, which is provided by the GraphQL library, uh, and that's a lot easier to work with. What that enhancer also uh, implements is the GraphQL multi-part request spec, uh, and that converts any attached files in the request to uh, uploaded files that you can just map as inputs to your data producers. So if you wanna know how to do file uploads with GraphQL, then that is what you should be looking at. Uh, the next step is to actually uh, hand it over to the request uh, controller in GraphQL, which gets the server uh, and the server operations. And this only really does one thing. It checks if the requ request is a batch request, uh, and if it is, it'll map over each operation in the request uh, and delegate to execute operation. If it's not a batch operation, it'll just call execute operation directly. We can look a bit closer at execute operation, um, which is already, sorry, let me see, which is already on the server entity, yes. And this gets uh, the operation uh, parameters. And it does a few things. The first thing is it gets the current implementation factory from the GraphQL library, and that's actually what tells the GraphQL library uh, how to function. We get the one that's now configured because we're gonna change it, and we want to be able to restore it at the end so that any other code using the library uh, isn't bothered. The next part is that we set the implementation factory. You can see that this is a Drupal service, so this would be a point that you could hook into the process if you need that, uh, that level uh, of control. And it'll just call the create method on your, uh, on your service. Uh, 
the next step is that it'll get the configuration from uh, the server entity. And this is actually a configuration class provided by the GraphQL library that con controls a lot of things. So we'll take a closer look at that uh, in a few slides. But when we have that configuration, we can pass it to the helper provided by the GraphQL library to the execute operation function. And the helper provided in the GraphQL library is a set of helper functions for HTTP uh, GraphQL server implementations. When we have a result, we want to make sure that there's always caching information available. So in case that's not already part of the results, we'll wrap it uh, in a cacheable execution results um, class and just tell Drupal that it's not cacheable. And this also allows the server to cache the entire uh, request in case that would be possible for the operation. Uh, and finally, no matter if you were successful or had some horrible error, we restore the previous uh, execution implementation. Let's dive into that configuration function because it does a lot of the heavy lifting for us. Uh, there's two parts that we can split it up in. The first part actually uses the plugin manager from uh, the GraphQL module to load our base uh, schema file. So this is configured on the server entity. When you create this through the UI, you will choose uh, which schema that server will serve. Uh, it instantiates the plugin, and what we didn't do in our example, but what we could do is implement the configurable interface, which is part of the Drupal plugin system, to actually uh, make our schema configurable. There's an example in the GraphQL module that uses this, which allows the end user of the server entity to actually configure um, which extensions are enabled. The second half of the module pulls this server config class uh, from the GraphQL PHP library. And it's actually interesting to go by each method one by one, uh, because a lot of the work is done by the GraphQL PHP library. But this is where the GraphQL module tells the library how it's going to work. The first part is the set debug flag, which just tells the library what kind of debug information to uh, do. And that comes directly from your server entity. Next up is whether we support query batching or not. If we disable query batching here, but we get a query uh, batched operation, uh, then the GraphQL library will uh, throw an error. Next is the validation rules. This actually currently comes from the uh, server entity and is not yet configurable, although there is a to-do in the code, so if you want to contribute, that could be a place to start. Um, by default, it will use all the validation rules defined in the GraphQL PHP library. Uh, these make sure that the operation is valid, um, that there's no weird things going on. There's actually quite a few useful uh, validation rules in there. If you wanted to implement things like uh, complexity checking or rate limiting, uh, this would also be a good place to hook into. Next is the persistent query loader, which is also coming from uh, the server entity. Persistent query loaders are actually implemented in the GraphQL module as plugins. Um, so while I don't have an example handy for you here, there is an open pull request in the GraphQL uh, module's GitHub. Uh, to implement the automated persistent query uh, loader for the Apollo specification. Uh, finally, we actually tell uh, the GraphQL library what our schema is. So this calls the get schema function of our base plugin, and that will actually load that schema file that we defined earlier. Uh, this is also the place where any extensions that you've defined, so our Drupal con chat module, uh, will get instantiated and loaded. The promise adapter is because the GraphQL library uh, works asynchronously. Uh, so if you were to use the GraphQL library in something like React PHP, then you could actually use promises to do work asynchronously. Uh, Drupal doesn't support that, so we just use the sync promise adapter to make sure that everything uh, keeps running synchronously. Uh, and then the context is a value that is actually passed into all of our uh, resolvers. So the GraphQL module uses this to uh, collect cacheability information for the operation. Uh, and that way it can do caching on the operation level. Finally, the field resolver uh, is what actually has the, contains the implementation in the GraphQL module that loads all these data producer plugins uh, and will actually call into our uh, resolver registry. If we go, oh, whoops. If we go back up a step to our execute operation function, uh, then we can see that now that we have this config, we actually call 
into the helper to call execute operation. Uh, and that call stack is interesting, but we'll go through it in a, a diagram. So the server execute operation function calls the helper execute operation function, and this will actually validate the schema uh, that you have to make sure that there is a schema, make sure that the server supports query batching depending on our, our uh, configuration, make sure that the parameters that were in the operation are actually uh, correct and valid. Um, if there was a query ID provided in the request for uh, persisted queries, this is where it would actually invoke the loader that we just configured, um, and then it'll, from that, find the operation it actually needs to execute. Um, in case the request came with as a GET request, it ensures that it's only ever a query because you're not allowed to do mutations or subscriptions over GET. Uh, and finally, if it's needed, this will apply any error handling. The inter most interesting function call it executes then is GraphQL uh, promise to execute, which is where the validations that we configured actually get applied. When the validations are successful, it'll call into our executor implementation. So this calls back into our service that we configured. Um, and it'll create an instance of the executor. And that's where we transition back from the GraphQL library uh, into our uh, GraphQL module, where do execute is called. Uh, and that's on the next slide. And the only thing that the executor in the default implementation actually does is take care of this operation caching. So it connects the GraphQL library with the Drupal caching system. If the request is cacheable, it'll check if there's already a response. If it exists, it'll return the response immediately. If it doesn't exist, then it'll execute an uncached uh, response and try to store it in the cache. If the request isn't cacheable at all, for example, because it's a mutation, it'll just execute an uncached uh, resolution directly. Um, from there, we jump back into the reference uh, executor, so we're actually back in the GraphQL uh, library and letting it do all the heavy lifting, uh, which, which calls into execute operation. An execute operation contains two branches. So for everything that's not a mutation, it'll call execute fields, and this will go in a loop, uh, and we'll do a breadth first resolution. So it'll actually go through all your top level fields first until it hits a point where it needs to start resolving promises to load data uh, and then continue in depth. For mutations, it also implements a loop, but it does things slightly diff different because the specification requires that mutations are executed one at a time to make sure that if any uh, point a mutation fails, that your next mutations aren't left in an indeterminate state. Um, you can see at the end that it would call resolve function, and that's actually the resolver that's back in our GraphQL module, uh, and that's interesting to look at. We configured this in our configuration uh, class when we called the set field resolver function, and it's actually a callable that's returned by the get field resolver function in our server entity. Um, if we look at the function, then we can see it takes four arguments and it uses our registry. The four arguments are actually dictated by uh, the GraphQL uh, library, and this looked a lot better in Keynote. Um, but the first one is the value. This is the value of any parent field, uh, or in case this is a root field, it would be the value you configured as a root field. Today, we didn't configure any. The second one are the arguments provided to the field uh, in the query. The third is the context. This is that context value that we created in our configuration uh, with set context. Uh, and the fourth field is actually info, which provides a lot of information about the field that we're resolving, like where it's used, what is its child selection. Um, and while we don't currently use this at Open Social, you could use it to optimize data loading. Um, if we look at the function itself, you can see that we use the context to actually create a field uh, context. So while we have this generic context that we bring along for the entire operation, we also create a context for each field that allows us to do field level caching. So we have caching at two levels, both at the field and at the entire operation. Uh, the next thing we do is we actually try to resolve our fields, which is where our resolver registry comes back into play. Uh, and once the resolution is done, uh, we actually check if the field is cacheable uh, or if the result is cacheable and we add it to our field cacheability information, 
and the aggregate also gets attached to the uh, cacheability information for our entire operation. The resolve field is actually the interesting function here in our resolver registry, uh, and it takes the four values from the GraphQL library and our own uh, field context. And the first thing it tries to do is to actually find the resolver uh, that's been configured uh, for our field with the get runtime field resolver, and that delegates to get field uh, resolver with inheritance. We can dive into that a little bit because the inheritance part uh, actually helps us out. The first thing we do is we find, we try to find a field resolver for, our for the type that we have and the field that we have uh, by doing a simple array lookup that you can see at the bottom. Uh, if we don't find a resolver, we return null. In case we don't have a resolver for this specific type and field, we check if the field can implement any interfaces. Um, and this is something we use at Open Social a lot, for example, for our connections. Um, if that's the case, that it implements interfaces, we'll actually do a resolver lookup for each of the interfaces that are implemented. So if you have some generic functionality, uh, like this connection class, then you can map the resolver only once for your interface, and it'll resolve the values for all of your uh, implementations. If we go back up to our resolve field function, then we can see uh, that in case we do have a resolver, we make sure that it impl implements the resolver interface, and then we call the resolve method. In case we don't have a resolver, we call our default field resolver. This is actually set to a function from the GraphQL library, which knows how to uh, handle arrays and simple objects, uh, where it will just try to access the property uh, of the value that it got. Let's look at an example uh, of one of these resolver implementations. Uh, and we'll start with a simple one, uh, which is the argument resolver. So this is actually the class that you get back when you call the from argument function on your resolver builder. And you can see here that it has stored this uh, name that we initially uh, implemented or input. What it does in the resolve function itself is it actually does an array lookup on the arguments that we got from uh, GraphQL. We can also look at a slightly more uh, complex resolve function for our custom data producers. This is not actually a resolve function of our data producer, but this is actually the data producer proxy that the GraphQL module uses, and this is where that field level caching uh, gets implemented. So the first thing it does is it'll prepare, which loads the data producer plugin that we've actually defined and told it to produce, um, and when that plugin is loaded, um, it'll make sure that all the contexts uh, context that are mapped, so this is where we in our annotation told it what we would be consuming, uh, that those are present if they're required. In case any of the contexts are missing, so this could be any previous value that failed to resolve, uh, then we're done and we just resolve null. Um, if they are present, we'll check if our data producer is cacheable at all, and we'll execute a cached resolution, uh, and otherwise we'll resolve uncached. And this basically just calls into your uh, data producer itself, and returns the value. Uh, and when you go through all of that uh, call stack um, and do that for all of the fields, that is how you turn your query on the left side into actually uh, some data on the right. Uh, now I realize that's a lot of information, so I don't expect you uh, to memorize this all, but I hope that when you're working on this, you have some handles to uh, actually dive into it and, uh, and figure these things out again. Uh, before closing, I wanted to take a short look at the other things we're uh, working on in the GraphQL uh, space. So one of the things we're working on is working together with the simple OAuth maintainers on a 6.0 version of the uh, simple OAuth module. Uh, we're looking to do a bit of separation of concerns of how scopes are defined and also make the module uh, ready for more third-party applications, because we found that the current implementation uh, works very well if you control both the client and the server, uh, but when you no longer control the client yourself, there are some uh, changes we'd like to make. Another thing is schema linting. Uh, this is usually quite easy with static analysis, but one of the challenges that we see with Drupal, because we have this great modularity, is that we actually need to figure out whether our schema is valid and doesn't actually break uh, when some of the modules are disabled. So we have to figure out what, uh, 
yeah, what module um, combinations are possible and whether those schemas are all valid. Uh, and finally, we want to implement uh, rate limiting. We haven't seen an implementation for this yet with the uh, GraphQL module. Uh, so this is going to be overriding some of those validation rules to look at, uh, yeah, complexity handling. One of the things we're thinking of borrowing is the Drupal debugger actually has a re some really interesting code to track uh, database requests. That is something we could hook into to see if we can figure out what the database requests are on a field level to actually uh, determine the complexity of individual fields uh, and radar requests by that. That's all I have for you today. Um, if you want to talk about other things related to GraphQL, uh, find me in the GraphQL channel on the Drupal Slack or on Twitter uh, or just here at DrupalCon. Um, yeah, thank you.